Well, good evening and welcome to our Christmas Eve service. My name is Ken. I'm one of the pastors here at Southside, and so I am glad that you've come uh, to be with us as a, as a family and to celebrate uh, such a special time. So we're grateful for so many loved ones who are back in town and just love you guys. I wish I could come hug each and every one of you. We miss you and glad you, you could be here with your families and celebrate my favorite night of the year. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to slow down from a, a busy season. And I just want to bring our minds and our hearts to think on the glories of Christmas. The, the incarnation means that God entered into this world. And so I don't want you to, to be like many of that first Christmas who missed Jesus. I want you to get the monumental significance that God came into the world that he created and he came in to save uh, sinners among who I am foremost. So tonight, we're going to look into Bethlehem's manger and see the beauty of the gift of God to this world that sent His Son to be its Savior. And so I want to open with a word of prayer, and then we will break open the Word of God. Father, I come before you this morning, and there are so many needs uh, here tonight. And my mind always comes back to that feeding of the 5,000. Father, just to see Jesus take a few loaves and a few fish and feed 5,000, a multitude. And I pray tonight, Lord, that you would take this word and you would feed every heart, every need that has come in here. God, they range from A to Z, and only your spirit by your word can touch every need in every heart. And so I ask, Lord, that you would minister to everybody where they sit here tonight. God, that you would meet them with what they need in this beautiful Christ that was born into the world. So God, come, do what only you can do now tonight, and may you be honored and glorified in our midst. That's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, tonight we're going to look at a passage in Micah 5, and what I want to do as we look at that, I want to set the context of the passage uh, that we're going to look at. It's in, it's in the Old Testament and, and setting this context, I think, will help us get the fullness out of what God would have for us tonight. So the first question I want to ask you is, when did God's plan for Christmas actually begin? And the text that we're going to look at tonight, he's going to tell us that it, it actually began in eternity past. The Godhead in eternity past made a plan uh, to bring about the very salvation that Jesus came into the world to accomplish. It didn't happen when he was born. It happened before the earth was even created. Jesus was called the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. He was always going to come into this world and die on a cross for his people. And so it's really important that you realize all of history then is about God unfolding this plan of salvation, his plan of salvation that be began its earthly fulfillment by a baby entering into a manger. And so this plan went back in the mind and heart of God before time existed. And so Jesus is the, the only one whose birth was not his beginning. And John 1, the word uh, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He existed forever. He's always been. And eternity stepped into time in that manger scene. And that, that's big. That has a lot of ramifications to so many things when you begin to understand the, the fullness of this picture, this story, why God has brought it about, why you exist, why you sit here tonight, and the whole world is based on this big plan that God is working out in our very midst, even as we sit here tonight. <clears throat> Secondly, why do we need a Savior uh, born into this world for us? <laughs> Why do we need that? I'm not a, a bad guy. I've never killed anyone. I, I gave some Santa guy, I was ringing a bell today, and I put a dollar in his little cup. I tear up every time at the end of it's a wonderful life. I'm just a good guy. Why do I need a Savior? Well, I want to answer that for you. God creates a world out of nothing, and he says it's good. It's very good. And then we find out there's a, there's a serpent called the devil. And God creates a tree of life, and he tells Adam and Eve that when you, when you eat, don't eat of this tree. If you do eat of this tree, you will surely die. And they were deceived by the serpent, the devil. And they ate, and they're instantly separated from God, and now they're hiding from him. 
A curse came upon mankind because of the devil, the serpent. And what he did is he, he broke our perfect union and communion with God. It said Adam and, and, and God walked in the garden. They had fellowship. They were one. They were in relationship. They broke that. They broke our communion with God, our peace with God, peace in our own hearts and peace with others. It all is broke and it's why it is the way it is this, tonight as we sit here. It broke everything and you, you just walk out in this world and no one needs to, to figure it out. It's broken. Everywhere you look is broken, broken, broken. Watch the news, broken. Look at your own heart, broken. And it all came from that fall that happened and, and, and we lost paradise. But I'm here to tell you good news tonight that right away our God is merciful and he makes an amazing promise right after that fall. And I'm going to read it to you from Genesis 3. <laughs> God said, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. God's saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to undo what that serpent did. I'm going to send a seed from Adam, and he's going to come into the world, and he's going to fix what broke that day. We need someone to undo the curse that came on mankind. We need to be brought back into a relationship with God to have fellowship. So the, the great need of this world is to be restored to God to be brought back into his presence. And that is what every heart is looking for. Every heart. That is why it's always December, but never Christmas in your life. You keep thinking this holiday is finally, this vacation that I have is going to finally fill me. This house that I just bought is finally going to fill it. This, this person I'm dating is finally going to fix everything and it never works. It's always December, but never Christmas. Because your real need, what you're trying to fill and what you're aching for is that you've been made for God and you need to be brought back into a relationship with this God. And so God, right after the fall, he puts an angel in the garden and he has a flaming sword and it says it moves in every direction. So any direction you turn, this sword of justice now to come back in the presence of God, sin has to be punished. You can't just walk back in and say, here I am, God. There has to be a, a punishment. There has to be justice for sin. He says the soul that sins must die. And so now to get back in the presence of God, your sin's got to be punished. It's got to be dealt with. You can't just ignore it and say, I don't like to think about that. I just, I just want to get back in on my own. <clears throat> There's no way back in. The soul that sins will die. So we can't be our own savior because of sin. Justice has to be met. God cannot violate his justice or he's not God. So sin must be punished. Third question. Who is this seed then that will destroy the devil's work and undo them and bring us back into paradise with God in that sweet relationship? Well, this seed is the one that we're going to look at tonight in Micah 5. And I want you to remember that, that the passage we look at, this is really important, it was written 700 years before Jesus came into a manger. 700 years before, it's going to tell you exactly the town and who's going to be born into that manger. That's, that's a big deal as well. Fourth question, what does Micah 5 then tell us about the seed that would come and bless the nations and bring salvation? And so that's my goal tonight. As so I want to unfold this passage then and answer this beautiful question for you that needs to be answered. You can't ignore it. You need an answer for this. And so a quick context as we take this up tonight in Micah 5. King Solomon has died. King Solomon was one of the great kings of Israel. And, and when he died, a bitter civil war broke out in this nation. And what ended in that battle was two kingdoms. And now we have a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom in Israel. The northern kingdom has spiritual adultery and, and harlotry. They're worshiping idols instead of the God who has delivered them from their bondage in Egypt and all that God has done for this nation. And he asked for their heart, and they're now worshiping pagan idols and, and wooden statues and all these things other than this God. So God sends Assyria, a great nation, a great power, to chastise them in 722 B.C. And he, and he wipes them out, and he takes a little small remnant and he brings them into captivity in Assyria. 20 years later, Assyria is now going to go after the southern kingdom. And they're outside the city walls of Judah in our context tonight. They're taunting Israel. 
They're, they're looking at the, there was a king in, the, in that kingdom there named Hezekiah, and they're, they're mocking him. They're, they're trying to get a quick surrender. And the king can't even protect himself. They're saying, how's he going to protect you? Your God can't save you. Just give up. And they're, they're mocking this southern kingdom. And so the southern kingdom now has played the harlot as well, and they're worshiping other gods. Materialism, we're told in the early chapters of Micah, is starting to rule the day. The leaders and the judges are corrupt, and they're being bought off. Can you imagine a country like that? <laughs> The rich are suppressing the poor. And one of the famous verses that you might even know tonight is Micah 6, 8. And he says, He has told you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you to do justice, to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. And that's the opposite of everything that was going on in Israel in those days. So God sends a prophet by the name of Micah. I like that name, Micah. Yeah. <laughs> to proclaim to them, that there's going to be a judgment, and then there's going to be a deliverance, a salvation. And God, I want you to hear this. He is always faithful to what He promises. And when He promises judgment, He will bring judgment. And when He promises a salvation, He will bring salvation. So both are going to come to pass in history. So Micah gives to the people the, the promise of a day coming. After all of their suffering and all their chastisement that will come from Assyria with a king who can, who, who can deliver you from all of your enemies. He says there's going to be a king who will come now and deliver you from your physical enemies and your spiritual enemies of sin and death. There's going to be a greater king that I'm going to send forth. And Micah gives the promise of the Christmas king in the midst of great sin and great suffering. And, and tonight, anyone who's sitting in that condition... I want to give you the great promise of the Christmas King and what he could do for you here tonight as you've come to be with us. Micah 5.1. It says, Now muster yourselves in troops, daughter of troops. Uh, they have laid, laid siege against us with a rod. They will smite the judge of Israel <coughs> on the cheek. And so I just want to ask a couple questions of our text. And the, the first question is, what? What is, what is going on as we begin this uh, couple verses? And so what's going on is the Assyrians have now surrounded Israel, and they're saying, hey, muster up your troops. And they're going to strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. They're going to humiliate him and shame him and conquer him. 2 Kings 18 is a description of all the ridicule that they started throwing out towards Hezekiah. And so this is God's judgment on the unfaithfulness of this nation. He's bringing a nation in to chastise them. So that's what's going on. My second question, who? Who can help us? I'm going to read that in Micah 5, 2. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one, with a capital O, one, will go forth for me to be the ruler in Israel. And his going forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. <laughs> Who can help us? That king. The one who's going to go forth for me to be a ruler in Israel. The king is not going to come for his own selfish agenda and his own program. He's not going to come and exploit Israel. He's going to not spend all of his wealth on himself that he amasses from all the nations. This one is going to be a representative of God. And he's going to serve God's interests and God's purposes. Just that little phrase, he's going to go forth for me. He's going to be my man. He's going to go forth for my purposes and what I desire to bring about. Jesus came onto this earth and he said, my will is to do the will of him who sent me. I've come to, to rule, to be the one for God, for my father. This king will look out first and foremost for the interest of God and not his own. He's going to empty himself and die on a cross, not looking at his own interests. And thus he will look out for our true interest. What, what a king this must be that God is promising to Israel 700 years before. And he tells us a little more about this who. His going forths are from long ago, from the days of eternity. The Christmas king is the eternal God. Isaiah said, uh, God said in Isaiah, I'm going to send you this one and his name is going to be Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And John 1 tells us that it was God who entered this world in that manger that day. The one born that Christmas morning was the eternal Son of God. 
God came into this world born to be the king who would save the world. Look with me, listen in verse 4. And he will raise and he will he will arise and he will shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. He's going to do it in the power of the Lord God and the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will remain because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. So this king is going to have power of of God, and he's going to shepherd, and he's going to take it to the ends of the earth. It's bigger than just Israel as the promise here. So what an amazing king that is now being promised to Israel. What what a future for his people. What, What a promise. And yet within this promise of the greatest eternal king who I'm going to give to you, he's, he's, going to, he's going to be the one with a heart of God, a heart of God. He'll be great to the ends of the earth like Solomon pictured, but this will go to the very ends. Every tribe, tongue, and nation, this, this king will go forth. And in, in this amazing statement, because where should a king like this ever be born? The greatest king ever who's going to rule all from the ends of the earth and in the power of God, how is he going to be born? Is he going to be born in the temple, the palace, Jerusalem, with all the nation worshiping him? That is the amazing thing I want to look at tonight. I want to look at the Christmas story of verse 2. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be the ruler in Israel. And his going forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. So I want you to catch this tonight. This king's going to be born in Bethlehem. And this little town is so small, uh, very little uh, significance. It's, so, it's just a lowly little town, a low-life place. And it takes a little of the flash and the glitter off this king that we just looked at. This king is amazing. And all of a sudden it lands, this king's going to enter in to Bethlehem. And so at the time, we're told in Luke 2, or Luke, yeah, Luke 2, verse 1 through 7, that it was a time when Quirinius was governor. And he took a census of all the inhabited earth. And he said, you need to go back to your home to register. Why now? Why? Why right at the time when Mary is about to give birth? Why did the king now say, go back to Bethlehem? The sovereign, glorious plan of God 700 years before is fulfilling his purpose. I'm going to bring him in to Bethlehem. And now in time and space, I'm going to have a Quirinius, a governor, say, go register to your hometown. And it just happens that Joseph is, is from Bethlehem. And he's going to go back there. And Mary is now going to give birth in the town of Bethlehem. So the trek begins. And they go into Bethlehem. And he's born into a, a, where there's no room at the inn, so he comes in and he's, he's wrapped in swaddling clothes and he's laid in a lowly manger. And then the birth announcement would go to these lowly shepherds, to parents who didn't have two nickels to rub together. Probably the humblest entrance you could ever have into the world. To be the greatest king and to enter into the world in such humility and lowliness as what we've been looking at as a church for the last three weeks. O little town of Bethlehem. Bethlehem means heaven's bread. God has given us bread. And Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. And whoever eats from this uh, will have eternal life springing up from within them. And so this, this baby was born into the, to the heavens to be heaven's bread for all who will behold and partake and receive this Christ. So that is the who. The who is the Lord Jesus Christ. My third question is How? How, how is this going to help? And I want you to listen to verse 5. This one will be our peace. This one will be our peace. He's going to come and he's going to, he's going to bring peace. And I want you just to, to listen to Luke 2, 8-14. through 14. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. <clears throat> and an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy, which shall be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, the promised King in Micah 5. And this will be a sign for you that you'll find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. 
And suddenly there appeared with the angel the multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. And so this king is going to come and he's going to, be, he's going to bring peace with God. And so he's going to bring you back into a relationship with God that we lost with Adam when he sinned. And he's going to bring peace to your own heart and what sin has done and the guilt and the way it's broken our lives and all that we've walked in here with. As he's, he has a way then to bring peace into your own heart and peace with others so your whole life's not just conflict and fights and anger and enmity. He'll come and he's going to, this king is going to bring peace. The most the most sought after thing in this world is peace. And this is the one who can bring true peace. I'm telling you, getting the right Christmas presents, eating enough food, having family around is never going to bring the peace that this Christ promises to give to any who will receive this King. And I'll ask, my last question is when? When is this going to happen from our text? <clears throat> well, the southern kingdom would later be destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 B.C., and Israel has not had a king since. So when is this going to happen? Who is the king that Mike is talking about that he's promising whose goings forth are from eternity? Jesus was born. King Herod is so jealous that this king's here that he, he seeks him out to, to find where the king would be born because he, he wants to kill him. And he calls in the wise men and says, where, where is he going to be born? And the wise men say, for they quote Micah 5, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. That's where the king is going to come into this world. And they quote Micah 5. So what was born in that manger Christmas morning was the hope for thousands of years of what God has been promising Israel. I'll send a savior. I'll send him. His name will be God, Emmanuel. And he just keeps showing us and telling us through the whole Old Testament. And now here he is. Since the first promise in Genesis, now 2,000 years so or so, he's here. He is the greatest superior king who would save his people from their sin and he'll reign over the whole universe and he'll bring peace to anyone who will come under his rule and reign. He'll give you peace with God and peace in your heart and peace with others. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let the earth receive her king, the Micah 5 king. Receive it. So my application, how can I find this peace? How can I find this peace? Well, what brought the enmity in the war between God and mankind was what? Sin. And so sin entered the world and, and it separated God and man. And there's that sword that now we can't get back because of sin and the need for it to be dealt with. That flaming sword must be satisfied. And I want you to hear this. 33 years after Jesus was born into that manger, he would go up on a cross and he would be put up on that cross and there God would pull out the sword of justice. He, he'd put our iniquities upon his own son and Romans 8 says he wouldn't spare him. He looked at his own son and he wouldn't spare him on that cross and he took the sword of justice, that flaming sword, and he poured it out on his own son for three hours on a cross as Jesus sat there draining the wrath of God for our sins, bearing them in our place on that cross cross so that justice could be satisfied and we could now have mercy, the forgiveness of our sins. That's the whole gospel. Listen to just, if you got your Bibles open, flip over to Micah 7. I just want to read to you how he closes out this book. Micah in verse 18, chapter 7. Who's a God like you? Who's, who's like you, God, who pardons iniquity? You, you forgive iniquity you pass over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possession. He does not retain his anger forever against your sin because he delights in unchanging love to, to, to love you now in this work of Christ and to bring you in and adopt you and love you for all of eternity with a love that doesn't fluctuate with whatever goes on in your life. He loves you with an unchanging love and he will again have compassion on us he will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, he, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. 
I'll, I'll bury him. I'll blot him out. I'll separate him as far as the east is from the west. Hebrews, he says, I will remember your sins no more because I remembered them on my son. And the sword of justice struck him. And he there died in our place so that now all of our sins could be separated. Everything that's killing you today is sin. The reason you can't walk back into relationship with God is sin. And God, on Christmas morning, He gave us a Savior to remove all of your iniquities, to save you and to separate you from them so you can be brought near to God. The greatest Christmas present that you could give your family tonight, your spouse or your friend, whoever it would be, is to receive this Christ. And to be forgiven for all of your sins. And, and to be brought into the family of God, loved and accepted, not guilty. There's just nothing you could give to them that they would rather have than that. Throw, throw away all the stuff under the tree and come have that tonight. Unwrap the gift of God, which is this king who's going forth, is from long ago and all of eternity. He has come into this world to save sinners among who I am foremost. Greatest Christmas present. So I'm going to close out. In 1865, a young preacher traveled abroad to Palestine and he came to Bethlehem. And this is where they think Jesus was born and he, he went into the church and he attended it and Christmas Eve service was from 10 to 3 a.m. I like that. What time is it? Okay. When we're done with this, we're going to John 1. And it says he was so touched by the service that he wrote a song about it afterwards. And I just want to read to you a couple of the lines tonight. And he wrote, O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above the deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in the dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hope and fears of all the years are, are met in thee tonight. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him, still the dear Christ enters in. Amen? The thing that's overwhelming this week is Christ is always born in Bethlehem. He always comes to little hearts. He comes to humble hearts. He comes to the lowly hearts. When Jesus says the way you enter into my kingdom is poor in spirit, and that's when you realize you don't have any resources to save yourself. A little religion can't fix it. Reading your Bible, being a good guy, nothing can fix it. And you finally come poor in spirit with nothing and lowly and humble. And you look to the humble Christ who was born into Bethlehem who is able to save to the uttermost all who will come humbly. So he, he's always born in Bethlehem. He always comes to the lowly, broken hearts. He's the Christ of the little ones. And so what, what, I, what I pray is maybe God is here tonight and he, he's breaking you. And he's making you poor in spirit. And he's showing you that this world doesn't work and it doesn't make you happy and it doesn't hold the key. It's December but never Christmas. And it isn't to make you miserable to bless you with what I'm talking about tonight. Because pride, prideful people, the movers and the shakers, they're never going to come to this Christ. And so the way you enter in is through Bethlehem. And it's for the humble and the broken who aren't good enough, the, the dregs of society, the rejected, not the wise, mighty, or noble. It's for people who are broken. God loves the broken, but broken in spirit. Or you finally just realize, man, there's nothing I can do to fix this. And you'll call upon the sweet Christ. And the dear Christ enters in by faith. By believing in what we've looked at tonight. So I just want to ask you, has he brought you to that place? This is hard to say. But if he hasn't, he will humble you on the last day. And all of your pride and standing against God and mocking him. On that last day, you will be humbled. And you'll be humbled into an eternal abyss. 
And so this isn't something we're joking about or just something to put off for another day. I can't tell you anything more serious. This is eternity that we're talking about. And if you choose to not humble yourself before this Christ, you will be humbled on your last day. Be humbled right now looking at this Christ as the remedy for sin. And He will be a Savior from sin. So I beg you, come to Jesus this night as a babe, humble with nothing in your hands to bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. He doesn't ask you to clean yourself up. He doesn't ask for your merit. He asks that you come as a humble sinner and look only to this Christ and call upon Him for salvation. Come to this King because Christ is still going forth even this night. And He's going forth and He's gathering in these humble babes into His kingdom. And He's blessing and He's giving us eternal life. Cry out this night. Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus. There is room in my heart for you. And so I pray that you would receive this humble Christ. And afterwards, I'm going to be up front with some other uh, men, leaders of the church. And if you want to come and, 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 and not leave here tonight till you have this Christ, uh, we're, we're here and we, we'd love to minister that to you. So I thank you for coming and um, just being with us here tonight and, and actually listening to an old guy talk about something so glorious uh, and beautiful. So we, we're grateful to have any visitors and uh, grateful for this, this body. And all I care about is that everyone here would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and you will be risen, raised up on the last day. You will have eternal life with him. So let's pray. Father, I come to you and I thank you for the glory and the beauty of this passage. I thank you for a salvation that you have prepared before the foundation of the world. And I thank you for the package. Oh God, it's the eternal one, your son, the beloved one. This package that would come in and, and, and be fully God and take on man and be fully man and live the perfect life that we should have and be put up on a cross and there die in our place and be buried and on the third day be raised again now and taken up into complete victory. Oh, I thank you for this beautiful package and I pray that everyone in here will believe upon this Christ. They would look only to him and they would find healing for their wounds and their, their balm of a broken heart and the sin that has uh, wrecked hearts and lives. Oh God, you have given a remedy. Let, let them look nowhere else to fix it. Let it all be found in Christ this very night. And it's in his beautiful, sweet name that we do pray. Amen.